welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast with JB and Jamie with the best guests, wine and chat. You know it makes sense. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Delighted to have uh, with us today, uh, Johnny O'Mara, top tennis player. Johnny, how are you doing? Welcome to the show. Guys, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great to see you, mate. Great to see you. Now you're uh, you are a red lefty, just like us, aren't you? You come from Arbroath. Can you take us yep. through? Take us through where you started in Arbroath with the tennis. Go back to when you were a kid. Yeah. So um, yeah, I started first started playing tennis um, in Monifith. I think the Next Generation opened there, um, and my parents, you know, my parents love the sport. Love well, love any kind of sport. So. They dragged me along and I grabbed a racket and turned out to be able to hit at least make contact with the ball. So, um, so yeah, started doing lessons there and then and then started playing at, at Arbroath, you know, pretty much every day of the week whenever, you know, whenever school was done and stuff. So uh, every Thursday night we'd be playing matches and I got into the men's team probably when I was like 10 or 11, which, um, you know, for me, it's such a good memory I have of tennis because it's kind of, it's how you start. It's how you, you know, start loving the sport. It's why I started loving doubles. It's why, um, you know, I enjoy the chat more than, you know, almost as much as tennis because you play, you play three matches in the evening and then you go for, you go for the dinner and stuff in the clubhouse after. And there I was, you know, like a 12 year old with, you know, 30, 40 year olds just trying to, trying to join in the chat, which I always struggled with. But, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I loved it there. And, you know, it was it was the courts. They had they had clay courts there for a while, which there wasn't many in Scotland that had that. Which um, I loved growing up on because it was it's a tough it's a, it's, and then it's why Andy he moved to he moved to Spain. Um, you know, to trying to get the clay court tennis in. So Andy, uh, who? Sorry, Andy. I'm trying to think of a different Andy in tennis. <laughs> but I can't, come with one. can't come up with one. Uh, <laughs> So like, you know, just like all the, 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 you know, it was a unique core and stuff. It was a great way to kind of, you know, just build and learn how to play tennis. So, um, yeah, that club, Arbor of Long Tennis, has got a huge part in kind of my tennis journey. And even still, I remember only a few years ago, I'll play for the men's team. And even now, if I was back on a Thursday night and I managed to get a call up, I still have a game. But you'd play at Arbor Tennis Club. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I only, I only did that a couple of years ago. I think, I actually got the the Graham Crab, the, the chairman at the time, actually got a pretty angry email off another another club because I just played Wimbledon doubles, and I had a couple of weeks off, and I went back home. It must have been must have only been a few years ago, twenty three or twenty four, and I went back home, and they needed a player for a Thursday night, and I was still registered as playing for our Brove, so I think I went to Canoel in Perth, had a game took all three points, managed to get the win. And next thing I know, Graham's messaging me saying they had, they had an angry email because they, they didn't think it was fair. But I can't believe you just said I took all three points. Like it was a shock. <laughs> well, it was doubles. There's two people on the court. Oh, right. Okay. I see what you mean. Yeah. No, no, two people on the court and, you know, they kind of, they didn't want to hit to me. So I can only play like 30% oh, right. of the points, you know? So I'm only right. touching 30% of the shots. So my partner has to hit. 70 percent so he had to have a good day he had to have a better day than i had to so uh no i still saw that as success to bring to bring to bring back the three points and who was the coach at our both that you had then it's, it's chris now but was he still was he there at the time that you were there no 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 i don't actually remember the coach at the time um i i had a coach at, in dundee in in the money fee phone called mark walker um he used to coach at our both but so you were a bit of a natural then. You accelerated through the ranks pretty quickly, yeah? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess so. I went to, yeah, I managed to, I did pretty well in Scotland for my age and then, um, yeah, moved from there to, to start training and playing with the British guys. And, um, and yeah, I did, I did okay in the, in the junior days. When everyone was the same height as me, because I was pretty small. So everyone was obviously pretty small. And then, Few people started to grow and stuff, but uh, no, I did. Yeah, I did all right. Who did you come through with with the current players? 
um, well, there was a great group of us in, in Britain um, in the 95 age group, so born in 1995. So you had Kyle Edmund, um, Cameron Norrie, um, and then a few of the guys who are playing doubles now, Luke Bambridge. Um, and that year had a great year in the juniors. I think the a few of the guys, they played the Junior Davis Cup, won that. We won the winter one, so it was it was a good age group. And then obviously Kyle went and you know made career highs like fourteen. Unfortunately, got a bit of a knee injury at the moment. Um, and then Cameron Norris just made Queen's final yeah. last week. So um, yeah, it was a, it was a tough age group. And and uh, again, always that's kind of what you wanted. You want to be playing in a in a tough age group because that's you know where you get the uh, the competitive stuff. So yeah, it was good. You're a bit of an all round sportsman, aren't you? Because you're good at golf as well, yeah. Yeah, so I was, yeah, so I, you know, my family house is, is Levin Grange, which is, you know, five, 10 minutes from the center of our broth, which, you know, back in the day had two golf courses. So, um, yeah, every evening I'd be, I'd be on the 16th degree chipping away, um, on probably to the annoyance of the groundsman anyway. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, I used to, used to love doing that and still, still play golf now. Yeah. Was there any risk of you being a golfer before a tennis player? There actually, there actually was. It was, you know, when I was 12, I think, it kind of had to make a decision whether I wanted to take tennis a bit more seriously or, or choose golf. And I choose tennis. I don't really know why. Do I regret it? I probably do. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> uh, what do you play off, Johnny? What's your handicap? One. What? Yeah, I play off one, yeah. Decent, decent. Yeah, no, I probably... I don't regret it, obviously, because, you know, doing what I'm doing. But uh, plus, if I was playing golf for a living, I'm not sure I would enjoy it. So, you know, if you were playing tournaments and stuff, I don't think you'd be coming back home and saying, you know, I'll go play 18 holes of golf. So, um, yeah, so you know, I chose tennis. I think I remember something in the back of my mind. I think I, I, think I decided to go tennis because I liked the... Um, the energy kind of thing, you know, whereas at the time I thought golf was a bit boring because, you know, you had to, it was all walking, you couldn't get your heart rate, you couldn't get pumped or anything like that. So I, I think that's why I chose tennis. And Well, the two of the most, the toughest sports in the world to be good at anyway, so well done on that. Yeah. <laughs> See, when you, you, you're watching the, the tennis now, a lot of you guys are serving, are serving, you know, 120, 30, 40 miles an hour. See, when you're a young lad, if only. What what sort of you obviously, speed? You obviously haven't you obviously haven't seen me play that much. If, you t if you're saying I'm serving one twenty one. No, not you. No, no. <laughs> but the, the the you know the top guys in the singles are are, are banging them down at, at that. But as a young lad, what what sort of speeds are you getting on a serve? I mean, it's yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, I, I was watching. I watched the matches last week of the guy who won Queen's. Yeah, he was uh, banging it down. Berrettini. Yeah, and he was serving at. I mean, he was serving ridiculous last week. I think he was over 140. It was 143 at one was, point. Yeah, when I was growing up, Greg Rosetsky had the fastest serve, and he was serving at his best was 142. And I remember everyone thinking at the time, that's mad. And this guy's now serving at, you know, 140 every game. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely, you know, it's definitely changed. It's evolved. And, um, you know, it, it almost needs to kind of, you know, the coaching and stuff needs to change a little bit because, you know, when we were growing up in juniors, it was a lot about, you know, forehands, backhands, volleys, kind of learning all that. And then you would do serves at the end of the session kind of thing. Whereas, you know, if you look at it now, it's actually serve and return is pretty much where the game is now. Um, so, you know, it's, it's changed a lot, but, you know, a lot of guys can still play big. Um the, the strings, the rackets, the, they're all developing the balls. It's all kind of helping as well. And these guys are animals in the gym as well. So um, It's sort of going similar to golf then, isn't it? You know, technology is making it going further. Golf is now turning into, uh, you know, that guy's just bombing it and gouging it. Remember he won the US Open, DeChambeau. Do you think yeah. tennis needs restrictions then? Slower balls or...? Not really. I think it's a. I mean, it's a little bit different than the the golf because you know there'll always be the skill aspect. Yeah. In tennis, you know, so you know Ber Berrettini, for example, of course he can he can serve massive and stuff, but when that ball gets back in play, you know he still has to have everything else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and as you see, you can see, 
Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, they're still dominating the game. So I don't really think, and I don't think it's the right way either. You know, I just think, you know, Berrettini obviously is doing well, but, you know, there's other players, Rublev, who doesn't have a massive serve, he moves well. So for me in tennis, there's, there's so much, you know, there's so many aspects to it. So I don't think that it'll, it'll cause that much concern. And, you know, it's just kind of, you know, there's just so many different game styles. Um, whereas in golf, they're kind of all doing the same thing, you know? Yeah. They're all yeah. playing against the course. They're all trying to just beat the course. Whereas, you know, some days Berrettini might come up against Djokovic, who doesn't miss a return, and then he's got no chance to win. So um, yeah, yeah. I think it's just diff different matchups and stuff like that. Yeah, you couldn't bulk up simply in tennis, could you? Because then you'd lose all your movement and stuff, wouldn't you? Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, you, exactly. You would gain, you know, you'd go from 9.10, 9 out of 10 to 10 out of 10 in the strength, but you're going from 7 in the movement to 5. So... Um, I think it's it's a little bit different like that and yeah I don't think it'll be too big of an issue for, for yourself then co coming up through through the ranks there as we as we touched on earlier on you're then you're, you're playing at the National Tennis Centre up in Stirling presumably and then the, the one down south uh, is, is it Roehampton that one yeah Roehampton yeah um, and then is that when you then go up to the the, the sort of the, the elite one after that is that the, the um, one at Bath is that the, the Bath Uni one? No, the no, performance so the main, center. No, no, the main one is the one that's at Roehampton. Right. Okay. Um, but yeah, that fin Denmark just scored a goal one nil. Um, <laughs> it was absolute, I wouldn't interrupt, but it was an absolute worldie. Um, no, so it, it goes. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a different setup. You know, there's you know you got five, six, seven uh, big tennis centers in in England. Um, and then a couple in Scotland, and they all kind of feed into one national tennis centre. So, you know, you'll have the main guys work out of national centre and then feeding into different places. So, um, yeah, I moved, I was training in Stirling until I was about 15, 16. Then I moved down to, uh, down to London um, and was training there full time, which, which I didn't really enjoy um, and probably affected me a little bit, you know, in my, you know, whatever in my tennis and stuff like that, because it was, it kind of went from, you know, being in school in our growth. Uh, I think I stopped in fourth year and it kind of went from playing tennis two or three times a week and then still doing school, still hanging out with mates and stuff like that to kind of just almost being, a, trying to be a professional tennis, but at the age of 16, which, which for me, I just, I wasn't ready for it at all. It was quite a big, you know, step that I took, you know, and it was almost like a jump that I took with one step. So, um, you know, it kind of gave me a few setbacks and, and then came, I decided it wasn't good for me and then came back home a few years later and kind of started back up at Sterling. And that's actually when I started to have a bit more success was when I, when I was back in Sterling. I started, a, I started a year at university there just to kind of, you know, just to kind of get the bit of normal life back into, you know, training but then also doing a bit of studies hanging out with with people and stuff and you know just feeling like you have a bit of a normal life that you know wasn't the case when I was in London it was you know it was so full on so that was actually when I kind of ha started having better results again. Was Judy Murray involved with you at that stage or? Yeah so Judy Judy helped me s probably from you know the age of eight to 15 right, sure uh, not, full, not full time but I would see her you know, a few times a month. I think she was maybe, she was working a lot with Tennis Scotland and obviously I was, I was one of the, you know, one of the players coming through in Scotland. So she'd worked with me quite a lot. Um, and there's a bit of a joke that goes around the, the British tennis guys that, you know, I try and emulate Andy in his, in his shots and stuff. And that's probably because, you know, she was coaching me a lot and I feel like we've got similar forehands, like the way it looks and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed working with her. She was she was a she was a good coach and obviously knew her stuff. Now, when you were just saying about a young lad, you, you did you not win the British Championships under under sixteens or something? Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah, that was 10, 11 years ago now, which is a little yeah, bit a scary. long time. And That's then that it, was because yeah. you had a good run at Junior Wimbledon as well. Yeah, good run. I lost to Kyle Edmonds uh, maybe in the last sixteen, which was. 
Yeah, that was a good run. Yeah, you bring me back to my singles days, giving me a little bit of an ego boost. Yeah, I wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> to remind you how good you are. Yeah, I wasn't terrible. It links into something else, which is, at what point then do you, do you decide you want to concentrate on doubles? Because there you are winning those sorts of things as singles. When does the, you know, when does the decision get made that, no, actually doubles is going to be my game? Yeah. Um, so for me, it was when I was about 22. Um, you know, I went, I tried to make it on the singles probably properly for a year and a half, probably from like, you know, 21 to 22, 23. Um, I was doing okay. I was doing, I was doing fine. I was having good wins. Um, but it's, I mean, it's so tough. Um, you know, there's loads of aspects to it. You know, there was financial struggles. There was, um, you know, I was struggling with quite a few injuries because I felt like I wasn't able to fully invest in, you know, the team that you kind of need to have around you. Yeah. Um, and then there was also other things, you know, there was reasons why I wasn't winning matches, you know, for whatever reason, you know, I wasn't good enough or, um, because it is so tough. For me, it's one of the toughest sports, uh, you know, there is because you, you just have to have every aspect and, you know, it's, there's just no place to hide. So if you're having a, you know, if you're having a bad day, you wake up and, you know, you, you don't feel quite, quite at it, then, you know, there's nowhere to hide. Like, you know, watching a football match, you know, if you, if you're, you know, right back or something's not quite on it, you know, maybe he can, he, the team can still find a way, but, but for tennis, it's, you know, you're literally out there on your own and, you know, at times I've struggled with that, with the, with the whole traveling, uh, the demands of it. Um, and like I said, you know, I was also not making any money whatsoever. You know, I was, I was losing money every week and it got to a stage where I was, I was playing singles and doubles every week, which is, you know, for, again, it's, you know, tough on the body that, um, you know, because, you know, when you get to ATP levels and stuff like that, you see that the singles guys, you know, they never really play doubles and singles yeah. week after week because yeah. it's, it's so tough to do for their body, but you don't really think about that when you're, you know, 20, 21, you just think, well, I mean, for me, I was going to these events because at the time my, my singles, you know, I'd be making quarters and semis maybe, but doubles, I knew I was, you know, top seed in these events. Um, so I kept on having success in the doubles. And for me, that was almost just paying for me to do it. So there was no way I could stop doing that and kind of keep, you know, fully put into the singles. So, um, you know, there's a few excuses there, but there's, you know, I'd never regret the decision because I don't think I could ever have properly made it in singles to the aspect that I am doing in doubles. You know, and I, I it was a it was a tough decision because I grew up wanting to be a singles player, but yeah. you know, at the same time, I grew up wanting to be a tennis player, and that meant making a living out of yeah. what I was doing, out of playing tennis. And you know, I spoke to you know, a guy, my, my coach, who was actually sat on the sofa watching Denmark v. Russia. Um, I spoke with him at the time and just kind of said that, you know, we had a deep chat and just said that, you know, I think it's time to maybe focus on doubles because, you know, the singles just wasn't quite working out. And, you know, maybe I could do pretty good things in doubles, which, you know, at the time was very appealing to be able to, you know, stop kind of having to, live the way I was living, which was, you know, you, you'd be traveling every week, not really knowing if you were going to make any money whatsoever, difficult to pay hotels, difficult to pay for flights and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I just decided to move into doubles. My ranking was getting to a stage where it was, you know, starting to look pretty good. I think I got a wild card into Wimbledon that year, um, which allowed me to get a pretty decent amount of money to be able to then fund the next few months of playing doubles. So, I mean, the decision kind of, you know, it was kind of taken out of my hands and it was the right, right decision to make. So mixed doubles, has that ever been on the horizon? Have... Yeah, I'm playing, I mean, I'm playing mixed doubles this year. I played it once at Wimbledon. You have to get, you have to get your ranking to a certain place to get in. Uh, but I mean, I think mixed is more, just, it's a bit of fun. There's not really, there's no points or anything that you, you get. It's just kind of maybe a bit more relaxed way yeah. of playing and it's less money as well obviously yeah yeah less money yeah so there's i mean there's not really much reason to be playing it if you're if all you're really worried about is rankings and points and stuff but it would be great to to have a run at a slam playing mixed you know because i think i mean again you see 
when the Brits do well in the mix, you know, people love it. So it'd be good to have a little go at it. Yeah. What's the discipline then that, that makes for a, a good doubles player? Well, I was lucky when I stopped. There's a there's a brilliant coach in in Britain right now who who focuses on doubles. Um, his name's Louis Caillé, and Louis' brother Yippy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that's, what, that's what we that's what we call him. Yeah, knew that was coming. <laughs> that's what, that's that's what coming. we call him. Yeah, um, and he's come up with a kind of system that you know kind of works well for doubles. And you basically just have to kind of be disciplined. Um, have all the skill sets because it is a different skill set to ten uh, to singles. It's almost like a different game, you know. It's fast paced. It's a lot more volley stuff like that. So um, you ju- you just have to kind of repeat the same the same drills, the same skills, and kind of get them nailed down so that you know at the big moments you kind of you you have your you, you know you have the best possible chance of winning and you only have to win 52 percent of points in a, in a tennis match and you're probably going to win so that's kind of what it's what it's based on is your strength at doubles you're I, I heard today that you're a bouncy net player or something or you're a jack in the box or something is bouncy that net player. yeah you're jumping around at the net or something you're lightning fast i mean yeah that probably describes me pretty well a bouncy net player yeah but you're pretty rapid at the net that's a positive in doubles yeah yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Jack in the box. That's what that's what I'm going with now. Yeah, but again, you know, also playing playing. Um, I don't know, like I said, I played doubles every other day at, at Arbroath, so I kind of I learned the skills pretty early. Um, and of course, you know, volleys and stuff, being quick around the net. That's kind of, you know, that's the bread and butter. So yeah. See, when you're playing doubles, one of the things I wondered, and this is probably a daft question, but it always seems when when doubles are uh, guys are playing that whether you win a point or lose a point you do the old fist bump massive pet peeve of mine massive i don't understand it no i don't is it understand an etiquette it. thing or what why do you do it then if you don't even like it yourself it's me. <laughs> i mean i mean we were actually again we we did sessions on it almost because you know it's about having a positive attitude it's about bringing the correct energy and if you're bringing that energy and that attitudes, then, you know, your opponents see that. And you can't. and also you want your partner to feel good. So, I mean, there was even a day where, I mean, like, like you've just said, I, I find it pretty bonkers. Um, and I also find it boring because, you know, if you're constantly seeing it, for me, there's no, like, there's no spontaneity in the celebration. Yeah. I, yeah. I would like, you know, if you win a great point, that's when I'd want to be like hugging my partner kind yeah. of thing. High five, whatever. But but it's now like, it's now got to the stage where if he plays a bad point and I don't give him the knuckles, yeah. <laughs> he, he's going to be like, oh no, like I've, I've messed up there. You know, so you have to, so if there's actually like a, it's not etiquette, but if he plays a bad point or something like that, I should be over to him pretty quickly to almost let him know that, like, you know, I'm not worried, no worries, let's kind of go. But, I mean, that for me is madness. If, if you need that sort of, you know, hugging on the court and stuff, you know, if, if you've hit a bad shot and you need to you need to hope that your partner's not mad at you, I think that's ridiculous. You could be a trailblazer here and change the, change the way doubles is played on that. I know, yeah, I could do. It is something I've thought about. I mean, last week at Queen's, so I've played with Dan Evans twice. Yeah. Um, and I, I get on with him off the court unbelievably well. We're really good mates, uh, you know, same hobbies. You know, we hang out with each other pretty much every tournament. And so I sent him a message uh, a few weeks before Queens. I said, come on, mate, let's have a game. You know, let's, let's, let's have a go out there. And I played with him once before in Winston-Salem. And Winston-Salem is, you know, 35 degrees. It, the humidity is 80%. It's ridiculous. So then I played with him there. We had a couple of matches there. And then I played with him here in Queens. And I kind of knew what was coming, but it was a hot day. And you know when it's a hot day in the UK, it feels yeah. bloody hot. So both matches, I'm absolutely sweating out of every hole in my body, like carnage sweat. And he doesn't sweat that much. And he obviously doesn't have to deal with another person on the court. So I played the first match in Winston-Salem with him. This was like two years ago. And I'm having to like change shirts after three, after like one set. It's carnage how much I'm sweating. 
and he's snapping at me, absolutely snapping. So I'll go to give him the knuckles or a high five or something, and I'm like dripping him with sweat. So the exact same thing happened last week in Queens. I think it was, you know, after the first game, I'm dripping with sweat because I'm on court with Dan Evans, Feliciano Lopez, and Yannick Sinner. So, you know, I'm sweating before I've even walked on the court. And uh, I've gone to give him a high five, you know, second point of the match, and he's just told me to pretty much do one and don't touch him for the rest of the match. <laughs> so, I mean, but I was fine with it, you know? So we'd be That's kind of future. like, you know, if I hit a good shot, I'd be kind of like flicking my hand at him or something. And, you know, he'd be like, yeah, yeah, stay over there. You're disgusting. So it was, <laughs> I preferred it that way anyway. The famously good looking Feliciano as well, eh? Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. G I mean, Judy Murray would have been uh, sweating there, I think. Yeah, I know, yeah, Deliciano, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's not bad looking. He's not a bad tennis player. He's, he's kind of got it all, unfortunately. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> See, just on on partners, then you you mentioned Dan Evans here, but you've you you've had a lot of doubles partners over over the years. Uh, we'll not name them all because there is too many to mention, probably. But yeah. you know, look, Dan, you know, Caminori there, um, et cetera, et cetera. But how do you go about getting your? Is it just as simple as? picking up the phone and going, do you fancy playing or? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, everyone uh -huh. everyone knows everyone. Um, everyone has everyone's number. So you kind of, you know, you have to reach your ranking and his ranking has to be high enough to get into a certain tournament. So, right. you know, at times you're almost not a person, you're a number. Um, and if that number works with the other person's number, then great. Right. Um, so it's and then other times, you know, you think that you might play well with some person or, you know, a lot of guys choose to only return on one side of the court. Um, so they'll say they're a juice side player and that's it. So then they need to play with an ad side player. Um, and then, yeah, you know, you just kind of throw messages around and stuff. It can be quite ugly at times because, you know, while you're a doubles team, you have an individual ranking. So, you know, you're, you're pretty much just an individual playing a team sport, which is another thing that I don't really enjoy about it. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you start losing or something and all doubles guys seem to think it's, it's the other guys, it's, it's not their fault, it's the partner's fault. So yeah, they'll be on the blower straight after the match messaging someone to, to play. So yeah. Well, behind can, your back to so say, look, oh, I'm, I'm playing with you next time, not him. Oh yeah. It, it can be right. filth. Yeah. It can be filth. Yeah. It used to be worse before COVID. They had, now that you have, you have to, you know, you can't go into the, place to sign in it would literally be you know you'd sign your name on a piece of paper beside your partner um and let's say only 12 teams get in obviously that number keeps getting higher and higher and yeah, you have to yeah. keep beating it so honestly i've seen some the, the last 10 minutes of let's say the signing closes at 12 o'clock it's just complete and utter mayhem for the last 10 minutes because you know if you're not in that week you're not playing you're not earning money so let's say i'm playing with someone and I've moved out of the tournament and now I'm now 13th, but there's someone who else is out I could play with that would get me back into the tournament. Right. You're just going to sack off your partner because you want to earn money. So <laughs> honestly, the last, the last 10 minutes at a tournament, it's this complete madness. You've got, you know, the, the, the tournament director there and then you've got 30 doubles guys just, you know, some guys used to travel with their own pens because the pen became that that important you know if you were last in with yeah, yeah. two minutes to go you pocket the pen so nobody could write down the name honestly it's madness but it's calmed down a bit now because it's they they saw the how it was happening there was like this is honestly this is complete mental so i think it's now like it's it's blind and you can't see who's entered so you can't sack your partner off every every yeah, so minutes. it says so you could arrange to play with somebody find out there's somebody else available and then exactly. you just you just bin the person you've said okay to before exactly yeah that's awful so yeah. that leads to two questions then one yeah i've i've had it done to me, <laughs> unfortunately yeah i've had it done to me which you know what wasn't the nicest thing and i've tried to do it to some people but I've never been able to because I just can't fully go through with it. So I mean, I'll always, I'll send them a message. Um, I mean, I had one recently that was actually quite a funny one. I had someone else message me and they wanted to play. And it wasn't one of the bigger tournaments. And I was just kind of playing it as, you know, I just wanted a bit of practice, but yeah. match play. Um, and this guy who was lower ranked 
had asked me to play and he's, he's a nice guy. So I was like, I said, yeah, let's go for it. It'll be a fun week. And then someone else a lot higher asked me to play. And I was like, what should I do here? So I remember speaking to a few people and all of them said the exact same thing. They said, oh, just sack off, sack off the guy you're playing with. Like the other guy's higher, you'll be top seeds, like for sure. And I was like, oh, I, was like I can't, I was like, I just can't do it because, you know, I said I'd play with him and, you know, I've got to play with him. So what I tried to do is I tried to like sneakily say that I changed which side I was returning and, and, and that now we're the, we, we return the same side. So like, oh, it's such a shame. We can't play, you know, hope you find someone else and, and have a good week. So I sent that message, I think, when I was flying to the tournament, which is poor from me, I'll admit it. Um, hopefully he doesn't listen to this podcast because he still doesn't know I did it. They all do. Uh, th- th- thousands do. <laughs> and unfortunately, he replied back to me saying, that's perfect because I've switched to the other side. <gasps> So, so he was absolutely buzzing. But what so happens that two stitched well, you? Well, so I had to play with him, but we were on the wrong side. <laughs> and, and we lost first round, so a bit of bad karma. Shouldn't do it. Oh, man. Yeah, and I never told him why I did it, so I just went there and I was like, hey, mate, yo, oh, I'm playing this side now, yeah. And mm-hmm. then he probably saw me a couple of weeks later <laughs> playing with Nori, and I was back to my other side. He's named up Miguel. I know. <laughs> so, that, so that's who you tried to bump. Yeah, I tried to. Yeah, <laughs> but he—I'm not sure he'll be listening to Smokies and Wine Willie with a with a Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, he loves a Sauvignon Blanc, yeah. does he? Does what's, his, what's 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 girl's surname again? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh well. Yeah. Nice yeah. recovery. Regardless of rankings and that, is, and, and you you might not be able to answer this for obvious reasons here, but is is there out of all the doubles partners you've had one where you felt you've clicked with more than others, let's say, regardless of the rankings or the equations, just when you went, yeah. this feels right, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, Scott Clayton, I played with him for three, four years, and that was who I had my first breakthrough with, was with, with Scott, and, and he's, you know, still is my, you know, my best friend. He's, he's not playing anymore, um, but he's living in, He's living in Jersey um, and he actually just, just got engaged the other day and I'm one of the groomsmen and stuff. And that, to be honest with you, I've, I've actually, I've had success after him, but I've struggled a lot um, since that because, you know, a whole, a huge part of it is kind of, you know, you're, tra- you're traveling the world yeah, and you're playing and competing with one person and you have to, you know, it's almost like, you know, it gets joked about, it's like a marriage. And, you know, you have to kind of get on with your partner. And, you know, that's not easy when you're from different places in the world. You kind of do different stuff. You eat different food. Like one says football, one says soccer. Like it's difficult to kind of get as close as you need to be. Um, And with me and Scott, it was, you know, we were best friends and we said, let's, you know, let's play. And we were both playing singles at the time. So it was, you know, let's travel around with each other, play tournaments and then, we might as well play doubles while we're there and, and try and pick up some results. And yeah, we had some amazing results in the, in the lower tiers of tennis in, in the futures. Um, you know, I think at one time we won, you know, nine or 10 futures titles in a row, which was, you know, f- like 40 tennis matches in a row, um, mm-hmm. which at any level is, is good. Obviously it was, you know, it was the lowest level and stuff. So it was, you know, a lot of matches we were winning fairly easy and, you know, at the time we were probably above that level, but because we were still trying to play singles, that was kind of the competition. Um, but they were my best years in tennis. They, they were, you know, they were so much fun. All the stories kind of, you know, when you know, I go back home and stuff and I speak about, you know, tennis, they're all from those years. You know, the years I've had recently of, you know, they've been successful, but, you know, I wouldn't say they've been incredibly enjoyable. Um, whereas that time was just, it was incredible. And, we got our first, that was who I played Wimbledon with for the first time. Um, and then we moved on to the next level, had some good results and stuff. And it got to a stage where we, you know, maybe we had different, you know, different ambitions, different goals. And it could have got to the stage where it was maybe affecting our friendship. So um, for me, that was more important than the actual, the partnership. So, yeah. Um, you know, I didn't want to spoil that. So I kind of, you know, we, we went different ways, but stayed just as close off the court. Um, and yeah, it's been tough since then because, 
you know, you have to, you know, when you're away in all these places, Chile, Sao Paulo, you kind of, it's just you and your partner. So you have to go for dinner every night and, you know, you have to see each other practice every day. You have to travel every day. Um, so you end up seeing a lot of the person and if you don't really get on with them, it's, it's pretty difficult. So yeah, it's, you know, you just kind of have to, it's good as well. I travel a lot of the time with my coach, uh, Toby Smith, who I get on with so well. I mean, I, again, I have to say that because he's on the sofa, but yep. I do get on really well with him. <laughs> so that kind of, you know, that helps kind of break up the time that you're with your doubles partner and you can kind of say, I'm just going to go for dinner with, with Toby tonight. So, um, you know, it's kind of, it's definitely a part of doubles that, you know, people probably don't realise, they probably think it's just, you know, you walk on court and you play doubles and that's it. But, you know, you have to kind of, you have to manage the off-court stuff as well. You've uh, you've done a lot of travelling recently. How many quarantines have you been through? You must be a professional at that. Uh, it's the wrong topic to be talking to me about right now because I'm, I'm in the shed with it all. Um, it's tough. It's mental. I, you know, since... Since US Open last year, every tournament we've played has been, like you said, either in a bubble or in quarantine and uh, the money's gone down for doubles. So, you know, we're not even really earning any money with it um, right now. So it's kind of, you kind of feel like you're doing it without, you know, there's no real point in doing it. So it's, it's, it's been difficult. Um, it's difficult to find the motivation. It's one thing I've struggled with when, you know, you're trying to play a match. Um but there's actually more benefits to losing kind of thing, you know, because say for this week, for example, I'm playing, uh, so I'm playing tomorrow evening. Um, unfortunately, I think I'm playing the same time as the Scotland game, which is absolutely winning. Oh, what? Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll see if, there, if there's a default in that match, then you will, we'll know why. So this could I've be a double off. bagel, very the quickest double bagel ever or something. Oh yeah. Probably a loss. Cause it's easier to do a loss of a double bagel. <laughs> But, you know, I'm playing the match tomorrow and if I win, I have to stay in this bubble that I'm in now, which is, you know, you can't, you can't leave the hotel room. So it was raining all day today and we've just been sat playing cards all day because you can't go for a coffee, you can't kind of do anything, which is a bit frustrating now, you know, when you've done, you know, all the lockdowns and stuff like that, which were obviously difficult for everyone and stuff like that. But, you know, you kind of see the world's, you know, and especially UK is in a pretty good position now, so... You know, it's a shame not to be able to at least, you know, like you say, go for a coffee, go for a walk, maybe have dinner and stuff like that. So, you know, like I said, if you if you lose, you get a few days out of the bubble. And that's what happened last week. We were in Queens, unfortunately, we lost. Um, and we were able to have a couple of days out and, you know, able to go watch Scotland at Wembley, you know, train, train, and then also maybe go do something else during the day. So it, it's, it's a little bit difficult because, you know, if you win, you're still in the bubble, and if you lose, you're not. And if you win, okay. you're not actually making any money right now. So it's uh, it's a tough one, but you know it's obviously it's difficult for so many people. My my mom works in the boots in our broth, so she's had a pretty pretty horrendous oh, last year and a half. So I, I definitely won't be complaining about my situation just because I'm having to do a few extra quarantines. With a match tomorrow, is it is it Hugo you're playing with this this week? Yeah. Have you played the the, the Skipski brothers before in a in a tournament? Yeah, we played them played them loads actually, maybe five or five or six times now. Um, we actually played them the, in the final of this event, um, Eastbourne ATP two three years ago. We played them in the final and we managed to sneak them out. Um, I think we played them in that year three years ago. We played them four times and managed to managed to bounce them every week. So that was. That was a pretty good year for that. But uh, yeah, they're good mates as well. So it'll be be fun to play them. You've played with the, the brothers, haven't you? Or Ken, one of, or one of them. Played yeah, with, played yeah I've, played with, I've played with Ken quite a lot, yeah. Well, if it is at the time of the Scotland game, obviously no fist bumps. That'll, that'll shave a few seconds off, yeah. the, off the match. I mean, never mind the fist bumps. I'm questioning whether I play the match if it goes on at that time. Dude, just when you talking about the old bubble and having to stay in the bubble, I wish Billy Gilmore had stayed in the bloody bubble. Couldn't believe it. Yeah, we. I mean, it was funny. We went to watch the went to watch the match the other day, and we were with two English guys as well. So we were obviously in their grill the whole time, and we could see how well Billy was playing. Because I mean, I obviously I don't know that much about football and stuff, but I thought he was playing unreal. He was he everywhere. Was. I know. So every time he touched the ball, we were shouting, you know, control the game, Billy. So, I mean, I was so pumped for him to play tomorrow. 
because for sure, you know, he would have been first, well, surely first or second name on the team sheet yeah, after absolutely. that performance. Yeah. And I'm fine. I'm, I was a little bit, it took me about an hour to get over that because I didn't, I don't see how we're going to beat them without him because he made such a difference. And I watched the Czech match and obviously, you know, we were fairly poor, I would say. Whereas it's completely yeah. different in the midfield with him the oh, other massive. day. So, yeah. bit of a killer. Well, it's a classic Scotland, isn't it? To find a system that works and now yeah. we've got to change it. Yeah. It is madness, actually. You, you, you can't write what, what just happened to Billy, unfortunately. <laughs> you literally yeah. can write it. Just on the on the game then on Friday there, you were obviously there with Andy. Andy. Murray. <laughs> <laughs> got you back on that one at least. Absolutely. Um, who Who's screaming their head off the most at that kind of game? You or him? Me, for sure. Oh, yeah? Me, for sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I go nuts and that sort of stuff. But he, yeah, he let loose. He let loose. I mean, he was, he obviously get, he gets a little bit nervous, I think, around, um, you know, because we have to go through kind of the public and stuff and, you know, he would have been going through England fans and stuff. So, I mean, he had he had hat on, hood up, mask up, maybe two masks on. Um, but then we, we, we had great seats. Well, we were quite far back, but, were, you know, it was pretty empty where we were. So he was able to get to get pretty into it. And, um, yeah, it was good fun. Like I said, it was me and him, his brother, Jamie was opposite us, but he'd done all, he, he had like this corporate stuff, you know, oh, so right, he was okay. like, yeah, <laughs> rubbish. he was like, yeah, half time he went and had like a glass of wine. He was eating some food. It was bollocks. So <laughs> he, he was over there with his, with his wife, you know, which for me, not sure that's how you watch a football game, but that's fine. Um, but with your wife. It was, yeah. Well, I'm not doing the wife, but you know, that's just, <laughs> You know, eating food at halftime and stuff, you know, that's not that's not for me. Um, and then we went with two two English guys. So uh, Liam Brody, who plays, uh, he was there as well. And yeah, it was, I mean, it was great stuff because everything changed after 60 minutes. You know, they were set, sitting down, faces absolutely gone. And we were se- we were celebrating nil-nil like it was a huge victory. I know, so, that's what we were the same. Yeah, it's funny, the, but it, it's... I haven't been to many live games and I haven't been to any recently at all. So, I mean, I can't even remember the last live football match I went to, but it is crazy just being there. Because I love watching football, but the last however long, I've not really gotten into that much. Um, I don't know why. And if I was to watch a nil-nil draw, I'd be like, you know, I've wasted 90 minutes of my life. And that's what they were saying beside us. You know, they were saying, what a waste of 90 minutes, you know. Should, Liam was saying, oh, I should be in Eastbourne practising now. What a waste of a lateral flow test, you know, all this rubbish. <laughs> and uh, it was the best no-no I've ever yeah. seen. Up, you know, same, like you're, same for us. you're celebrating anytime Len- Lyndon Dykes wins a header, you're going mental. I know. <laughs> um, we get a corner and it's, you know, crazy stuff. So it was it was an unreal way to, to watch the game, yeah. It was it was unreal. Would, would you put it up there with Gayfield? No. <laughs> no. Not in the same calibre as Gayfield, no. Now, over in Melbourne last year, um, and, and this probably wouldn't have happened without lockdown, actually, you got the chance to watch the Arbroath games because we had the old Arbroath TV on mm-hmm. uh, at that stage. Um, yeah. And you wouldn't have been able to do that without lockdown. So, Yeah, that's a good point, but I think that match was on BBC Scotland. Oh, because it was the Dundee game, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the Dundee game. All oh, so. right. Have you heard the Fermer at all, no? No, we've I heard haven't, him, no. We've had them on Smokies and Wine a few episodes ago, man. They're cracking, Ewan's a cracking lad as well. They're, they're good, good fun. Yeah, no, I've tried, I mean, I, I've tried to, I've tried to watch it a few times because, like, I'm now really good mates with James Cragen. Yeah. Um, and that's, I, mean, I love, obviously, enjoy watching him play. Now, the only issue is, I've every time I've watched Arbroath play, especially when I go to the game, I've never, I've never seen them win. Jinx. What? Yeah. I've never, I've been to, I've been to, honestly, I'd say like 30, 30 plus games around that region. I've never seen them win. That's, cool. <laughs> That's crazy. Stop going then. Just stop going. Well, we're in the championship now, aren't we? So yeah. it's kind of, I've stopped kind of trying to go and we're winning matches again, but I need to get to one where we, you know, I'll, I'll message Craig and say, just tell me, tell me one that's a definite win, you know? <laughs> And I'll get to that one, and then it's done. It's broken. Again, we don't want to keep hanging on about uh, Andy Murray, but 
you, you're with him. How is he just now? Is what kind of place is he in? Is he in a decent place? Yeah, he's in a great place. Um, I mean, obviously he's you know he's having a few struggles and stuff, and it's all it's all new because no one's kind of doing what he's doing. Yeah. So it's it's kind of difficult to, I guess it's difficult for him to kind of make any plans because you know when there's let's say bruising in that area, what can you do because there's a metal thing yeah. bruising it. Um, there's there's nothing you can really do there, but. No, he, I mean, yeah, I think he's in a great place. You know, will he compete to what he did? Difficult to say. It's going to be very difficult. But then again, it's it's a tough one because, you know, you kind of, I look on Twitter quite a lot at the reactions that, you know, Andy gets and stuff like that after matches. And I think maybe he's been maybe finding it a little bit difficult with kind of how the reaction he's getting because, you know, every time he plays a match and he loses now and he's not playing the same level he did, or he's losing to people. You know, let's say at Queens when he played when he played Berrettini. If that's Andy in his prime, he's able to return those serves and then get into the points. And in his prime, he would have beaten Berrettini. So you get people on Twitter that you know will write to him and say, "Give up tennis, you're never going to do the same thing." But it's really, yeah. There's lots that he, he gets he gets a hard time just because it's kind of, you know, it's Andy Murray, so it's kind of they're expecting him to. Yeah. yeah to win everything again they're expecting him to you know the guys won two Wimbledon so he's going to win it again and if he doesn't it's a failure but you know it, I guess it's for him it will have changed like what what does he see as success now and I think people find that a little bit hard so you know I think he's he's fine with what he's doing because he's able to live the life that he loves doing you know which unfortunately he's had such a tough time with injuries that you know, that stopped him doing what he loves, which is obviously, you know, really difficult to deal with. So, you know, he loves training. He loves the, you know, he loves the crack around around training, around around tennis at tournaments. You know, he's always, you know, downstairs in the mixer with, with the guys having, you know, having banter and stuff. He loves competing, loves being out in a match court, playing in front of people. So, you know, it's it depends on, on what you see as success. So for me, you know, him being out there and being able to compete and going into Wimbledon and maybe winning a few matches, yeah. that's unbelievable. But, you know, you, it's difficult to get past the fact that it's Andy Murray. I mean, I had that conversation with him the other day and it was, you know, he was kind of saying, oh, you think I can win Wimbledon, do you? And I was like, I was like, yeah, I think so, yeah. I was like, I don't know why not. Like, oh, you're hitting the ball great. <laughs> I think you can do it. And he's like, it's not easy, you know? So it's... uh it's a, it's a difficult one, but I think he's you know he, he's in a great place and you know great great fun to hang out with. If he he'd make a really good uh, doubles partner at Wimbledon next week. Yeah, he? well, I actually asked him, which which was so optimistic. I uh, but he wouldn't have had a good enough ranking for that for you nowadays. I think he would have got a wild card. I think <laughs> I think the guy who's who won two Wimbies and Olympic two Olympic golds probably finding a way to get himself into the doubles draw. <laughs> um, we, we had a British golf day probably like three years ago now and he, he was abusing me because he you know I love my golf and I play a lot so he was absolutely abusing me saying you know I've not got the I, I, there's no chance I'm winning there's no chance all this like you're rubbish blah 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 and we were playing at we were playing at Wentworth so the deal you know he said to me he said there's no way you're breaking there's no way you're breaking 90. You're going to break 100. You're terrible. You're <laughs> awful. You know, it's a week before the BMW championships. You haven't got the, you haven't got the bollocks for it, you know? So he was giving me all that. And I said, I think I'll probably win. So he said, well, if you break 90, I'll play doubles with you at any event you want. And if you don't break 100, I'm never stepping on a tennis court with you again. Oh, the pressure. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I went and shot a 78. Killed everyone by by like six or seven shots, maybe, and I still haven't played with him. So that was a that was a bogus call. So he's all you, yeah, yeah. So I sent a message the other day to it was probably like two months ago now, and I said, Andy, any chance you? And I've been struggling to get partners and stuff just because of you know just the situation. Obviously playing with with a few of the British guys, and I said, any chance? Uh, I said, are you fit enough to play the singles at Wimbledon? Because if you are, I'm guessing you're going to tell me to do one for asking doubles, but if you're not, any chance we're going to have a game of doubles? And he was like, no, I'm playing singles. So no. I'll, have to, I'll have to wait for another event to call him up on that one. 
<laughs> you'll get him. You'll get him. Just you, you mentioned about the, the the training regime and things like that that he probably un undergoes now is is obviously going to be different. What for you? What is a training regime like then for for tennis? Yeah, I mean it depends. Uh, it's different again for doubles because doubles players because it's not physically as taxing. You're able yeah. to you play thirty five weeks of the year. Um, so doubles is a lot more just kind of being able to just keep doing it week after week. So it's a lot more, you know, let's say looking after the body a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I haven't actually found, I, I find it very easy physically doubles, moving from singles to doubles. I've not, I don't find it very strenuous at all, but it's a lot more explosive kind of movements that you have to do. So it's, it's a lot of time on the court, just trying to, you know, like I said, you kind of repeat the exercises to kind of, you know, in the big moments, you know that you can nail down certain patterns of play that give you the 52% chance of winning. Um, and then it's a bit more, you know, explosive stuff like that. Um, so it's maybe, it, it's, a, it's a bit, it's a bit longer, but you know, less, you know, it's a lot less work kind of thing than it is, it is for singles. Singles is, for me, from what I've seen, singles is, is one of the toughest, you know, having to train four hours on the court and then you have to do two or three hours in the gym and you have to repeat that every week of the year pretty much. So it's, it's, it's intense. a tough one. And that all the other guys are doing that. So you kind of, you have to keep doing that, you know, whereas the, the physicality of it in doubles isn't quite the same. So it's not, not much of a difference. So you wouldn't go down the path of changing your diet and all this sort of stuff. Remember Djokovic famously went gluten-free and... I probably should do. I probably should change my diet. <laughs> he looked at his coach there to see what he was saying. Yeah, literally, you said it and, and he's he's watching the football like this and he's turned around and looked at me and gone, oh, this is a decent question they've asked you. <laughs> I've smashed a pizza tonight or something like that. Um, no, I don't think it makes that much difference. Again, it does for singles because you're playing best of five sets, you know, but for doubles, you know, it's, yeah, it probably makes a little bit of a difference and, you know, maybe this podcast will make me think about it. You know, maybe I should go down that route. Um, but uh, no, I've not really, not really had any issues with that. So next week you'll be vegan, yeah? Yeah, probably. Yeah, gluten free at least. Yeah. What about the courts? How much of a difference do, do the 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 types of surfaces make? Yeah, big difference. Um, obviously, clay's a lot clay's a lot slower, so normally get longer matches on that. Uh, the grass, the bulb doesn't really bounce. Um, so you have to be a lot lower kind of thing for most of the match. So, you know, you feel that more, you know, you'll, you know, you've played grass because you're feeling it in the groins the next day. A lot of players obviously always struggle from clay to grass. And there's always been that issue with, you know, scheduling and stuff because obviously it goes from the, the French Open to yeah. the grass season straight away. And it's two completely different surfaces with movement wise. So I think, I think that does a lot of, you know, damage in kind of the first few weeks of adapting to it. And then hard courts are all pretty similar, but, you know, again, obviously pretty, pretty tough on the body. What's your favourite? Which one suits you the best? Well, I used to think grass. I used to absolutely love grass, but I haven't found any results on the grass the last two years. So need to try and need to try and change that. But I love playing on grass. It's for me, it's, it's, it's more fun. It's, you know, it's a lot more skill related. If you know, if you watch, if you watch Wimbledon, you see a lot more slicing. You see a lot more players coming to the net. A lot more kind of little drop shots, kind of thing. So, whereas playing hard for me, it's a little bit, a little bit too physical. Especially when I'm watching now, as you know, when I watch singles as a fan, kind of thing, I could find myself getting a little bit bored watching a hard court or a singles match or a clay court match, but. On the grass, I, I always find it so so entertaining. Grass court, obviously Wimbledon starts next week. Yeah, um, the draw comes out on. Is it Friday? It comes out. I think so. Yeah, around then. Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you've nailed down a partner already for that. Surely, yes, I'm I'm playing with the same guy I'm playing with this week. Hugo, I use Hugo, right? Okay. Yeah, and you're not yeah. going to sack him off tomorrow or something, no? Well, unfortunately, I can't because the list's already been done. Unfortunately. If we were to have a roster tomorrow, I could maybe say I'm changing sides or something, you know, get rid of him. <laughs> I'm starting an underhand serve. You, I won't be yeah. any use to you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Go find someone else. And what's it like? Obviously, you've well trodden down the, 
the, the Grand Slam tournaments now, but that, that first ever time that you would have done your first Grand Slam, Wimbledon, what, what were you like walking out? Were you quaking in your boots or because you'd done the juniors, it wasn't quite like that? Yeah, it's something I actually struggled with. I never had any issue with any of the tournaments I was playing, but the slams, the first time I played them, I was, yeah, I wasn't very good at all. Um, you know, I struggled with just kind of the expectation of it all and and how big it was and stuff like that. And I didn't really do anything in the first time I played them. I think maybe I won one match in Australia, maybe, and that was it. Um, just because, you know, that's what you grow up watching. You watch the slams and now you're there and stuff. It, yeah. You know, it can be difficult to perform, but once I got over that, I actually, I now, I now love, I now love it because, you know, that's that's where you want to, that's where you want to perform. You want to perform at those on those big stages. Um, Wimbledon for me is different. Um, I'm looking forward to it so much this year because I haven't, you know, when I first played the two Wimbledons, I think both times I was wild card. Whereas this time, you know, I'm in on my own right, and I've had some good slam results. Um, at the US Open and then Australia and then I unfortunately wasn't able to play at Wimbledon so I haven't really gone into Wimbledon with much um, you know really much slam wins behind me so it was difficult um, but yeah I remember the, fir the first time I played Wimbledon I remember it clearly I was you know you're waiting for the nerves to kind of come yeah. um, and for me I, I much prefer when they do come before a match because then you can kind of get rid of them almost you know you kind of know they're there and then you know, once you're kind of on the court hitting and maybe get through the first couple of games, you know, the, the nerves go away. But I remember I was playing with playing with Scott. We had a good draw. We were on a nice court and I should have been nervous, but I wasn't. So I was a little bit like, oh, what's, this is brilliant, you know. So walked onto the court. Um, I think it was court four, a nice, nice little court. I had, you know, my family there and knew quite a lot of people and, you know, I was still feeling great. And I was like, this is, you know, this is the first time I'd ever played a sound. This is brilliant. I didn't expect this. Like, I played Dublin Futures last week in the final. I could barely <laughs> tie my shoelaces. But now I was like, this is bloody brilliant. Um, and then, yeah, I warmed up and still feeling good. I think I played the first couple of games and I was feeling, feeling great, playing good. I think we held the first game, maybe nearly broke second game. And I was, you know, bouncing around, loving it. And then it was my turn to serve and I was on the left-hand side of the court and I've thrown the ball up to hit my first serve and I've thrown it up and I've seen the whole of the centre court. Um, and court four is literally right beside centre court. I remember seeing Andy Murray was playing Dustin Brown and he was like 6-2, one love up. And I remember throwing the ball up and just literally, mind my French, but just in my head just going, shit, you know? <laughs> And I threw it up and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh my, I'm playing Wimbledon here. What am I doing? Um, and then went and got broke into love, I think. Barely put a ball in the court. Um, and then to be fair, for the rest of the match, I was very average just because I wasn't able to kind of shake off that feeling of, you know, crap, this is, this is Wimbledon. This is kind of what I've wanted to do. And I'm here and I'm up. So I was, I didn't, I didn't play very well. We actually won that match but it was it was a bit lucky I think Manorino pulled out or something so um, I haven't really classed that as a win so I don't feel like I've really done anything at Wimbledon yet so uh, yeah I'm hoping this year that you know with a lot of slam matches behind me and stuff and a few good results it'll be it'll be a good one Absolutely and crowds back as well which I think makes a difference if you're a Brit at, at Wimbledon the crowd cheering you on um, is, it must be a good thing or does that add to the nerves? Uh, no, it's a good thing. Yeah, it's it's obviously, it's a great thing. It's a different kind of crowd at Wimbledon. It's a very polite crowd um, to say. I mean, I, I, was, I would prefer it to be the complete opposite. I don't want my opponents, if my opponents are from, I don't know, I'm playing a guy who, they're both from Brazil or something like that. If they play a through-the-legs winner, I don't want them getting clapped. Yeah. Um, and that's how it was. I just played the French Open and we played... Uh, the guys who won the event actually, Herbert Mahout, and they're um, they're big. They're pretty big in France. They played Davis Cup for France. They've won the Davis Cup for France. And honestly, I played a couple of very good shots, but Norrie played quite a few very good shots, and there was not a single clap for us. And I remember coming off the court, and I think a few people were saying, "Oh, I can't believe there was nothing there. Like, what a shot that was!" And you got nothing. And I was like, "Well, that's the way it should be, really." You know. 
Like just as well you high fived yourselves then. No, I know exactly. Well, yeah, well, I was sweating too much, so I didn't get anything. <laughs> yeah, but no, it'll be it'll be so good to. You know, we haven't been to Wimbledon now for two years, and it's yeah. it's such a good event. So it will be. It's a shame I won't be able to get. You know, my family won't be there or anything because. Um, you know, it'll be limited and stuff, but it'll still be it'll be good to play. Obviously, you're the doubles. Who would be your pick for the singles? I mean, I find it hard to look past Jocker. I'd love Federer. I would. Yeah, I'm the same. I would do anything for Federer to win the tourney, but I find it hard to. Like I, I saw someone say on Twitter earlier, unless Djokovic goes and hits, starts whacking balls at lines judges again, I'm not sure it's being him. Yeah, Federer's, um, I hate to say it, but I think he's a little bit old, eh? Yeah, I think this could be his last chance on, on the grass. Um, he's still, still amazing. Well. Still amazing, but yeah, I think he's just gone a couple of years too far, I think, for that. Yeah, I agree, yeah. yeah. And what about your own chances in the doubles? How are you guys feeling? Yeah, well, I, I haven't really played with Hugo before. Um, he had a good run at the French. He's he's had he's been on a good bit of run the last few months. So, um, you know, I, it's it's a difficult one. It's kind of I'd love to I'd love to get into the tournament. That's my that's my main thing. Once I get into the tournament, then I feel like anything can happen. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of the same when I had a couple of a good run in the Australian Open. You kind of you almost want you want to get into the tournament and then you know, anything can happen. So, you know, I believe I can have a, a great week, but just kind of have to take it one match at a time. But yeah, it'd be amazing to, you know, I've, I managed to make the second week of a slam. So hopefully, you know, the next goal is to try and, you know, try and make the semis, make the final, win the event. So, um, yeah, I don't see why not. And win or lose, is there a big, and COVID's maybe spoiled a lot of it, but is there a big party culture when a tournament's finished? Do all the guys not, get not together really. or not really? No, not really. It's one of, again, it's a, another pet peeve I have of tennis. You know, you pretty much, pretty much everyone will lose, you know. So you, so unless you win the whole thing, mm. which is, you know, two guys in doubles and one guys in singles, you're kind of walking away from the week as a loser. Mm. Um, so you're always a little bit flat on that day, the next day. Plus there's events every single week of the year. So if you lose on the Thursday, maybe you're flying on the Friday to another event. Right. Um, so it's, you know, you, you can never really enjoy kind of the moment or anything like that because you just have to, you know, we had a good week this week. Let's go to the next week and do it again. Whereas, you know, if it's football, you are you win the match on Saturday. You've got however long. So you can, Saturday night, you can have a few, few Morettis and you're loving it. Um, <laughs> But Wimbledon's Wimbledon is probably the one, especially for Brits. I think there's it's maybe the one week where you can you can find a little bit of time. There's the famous pub in Wimbledon, the dog and the dog and fox that you you see a few players at. So um, you know, if I have a decent run, I think I'll definitely be be making an appearance at Dog and Fox. So on that subject, do you get a, a long holiday in tennis? Never mind this COVID and that recently, but is do you get a big break or is it just Go, go, go all the time. No, I mean, I had my first first ever real holiday in uh, last, well, before COVID, so the year before last in November. Uh, I went to Dubai with my girlfriend and that was, that was honestly since, since the age of like 16, that was my first holiday because, you know, one, you're either trying to save the pennies and you don't, you don't want to spend that on uh, going on holiday if you have to buy flights and stuff to go abroad. Plus, I mean, I absolutely, I love, I love Scotland. I love my home so much. So my holiday is almost kind of being at home. So, you know, I, I, you know, obviously traveling all the time. So I kind of want to just stay at home kind of thing. But, you know, I think, yeah, I'll definitely, definitely try and do something at the end of this year, probably. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. You mentioned Moretti's. We'll make sure then that we have a few Moretti's watching you next week. Um, in your in your first match, whether that be Wednesday or Thursday, doesn't really matter to us. We'll Moretti up, or morning or afternoon. Yeah, oh. in your honour, we'll do it just nice. for you. Perfect, love it. Great <laughs> stuff. But thank you very much for giving us your time. All the best for next week. Um, well, this week, first of all, obviously, you've got the the, the tournament this week to get to get done and dusted. I, I suppose that's good preparation and getting to getting to click with Hugo as well for 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 into next week. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, can't wait for it. All the best, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Awesome, guys. Thanks for having me. Good fun.
You've been listening to the Smokies and Wine podcast, sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Thank you.